Alex, because I should. I feel obliged I did not intend to speak on the bill because, in fact, the bill was in my name and I ask that the learned Attorney General should lead in this matter, having regard to the excellent leadership he has brought as a member of the task force and as a minister responsible for the mitigation council and all the work that has been ongoing as part of our efforts to deal with a global pandemic, which everywhere has brought pain, which everywhere has brought on a crisis, not only of a health nature, but certainly of a fiscal and economic nature. So it is serious. But what we can say, and what we are to commend, that the leadership of St. Kitts and Nevis, in the face of the worst pandemic ever seen in a lifetime, has been second to none. And we have received international acclamation and recognition for our superb performance. And every citizen, and every resident of my beloved country of St. Kitts and Nevis can share in the pride of knowing that our country is doing well. Our country is seen as an example of a small country that knows what to do in the face of a pandemic. And that is why persons come to us to ask questions for us to share our experiences. That point must never be lost upon our people. When we listen to the news in the United States of America, the most powerful country in the world today and for time to come, we understand that there we have confusion. There the virus is out of order out of control, and no one seems to have the answer to it. The discipline, the sacrifices which our people and our country has made over the last seven plus months is heroic, and it has led us to be at this place. We are among all sovereign countries in the world, we have the lowest number of confirmed COVID cases. And we stand in contrast to the United States of America. We stand in contrast to Mother England. We stand in contrast, contrast to France and Italy. We stand in contrast to Jamaica. We stand in contrast to Antigua. We stand in contrast to St. Lucia. In that at this time, we not bored. We have not one COVID-19 death recorded. And we commend all for those indicators of success. Today, we have come and we have brought a bill that over the last couple of months, we have had time to see what can work and will work. We have had time to look at the experiences of other countries to determine what are the best practices. And we have been able now to codify a number of them in terms of a bill carrying the short title of the COVID. 19 Prevention and Control Bill 2020, an important piece of legislation, and it is informed by science. It is informed by the advice of CAFA, and it is informed by the advice of the World Health Organization and our own experiences. I had to rise, Mr. Speaker. If only it was to commend 
the citizens and residents of St. Kitts and Nevis for what we have accomplished. I had to rise, Mr. Speaker, to commend the leadership of all in the health sector, in security, and all the other areas of government, customs, immigration. In fact, it has been an all of society approach. I want to commend, as Senator Phipps did, the work of the church, their compliance, their early response and adoption to protocols that has helped keep our country safe. And so I wanted, Mr. Speaker, to record this moment in time, the success of our efforts, and to give God thanks, and to acknowledge, really, it has been an all-of-a-society approach. An all-of-society approach in which the Chamber of Industry and Commerce and other citizens were given opportunity to make their input with respect to the very regulations which came out of the Emergency Powers Act. That is where they come from. That is what the state of the emergency was activated to allow us in this country to respond quickly and decisively to a pandemic which is the most contagious in the world in recent times. That was one of the benefits of the state of emergency. I recall one Saturday on the program and win inside the news. I was there with our chief medical officer, Dr. Hazel Laws, and she said in response to a question, the state of emergency has provided me with the tool that I need. The tool that I need to ensure that we could respond quickly should there be a difficulty in the country in relation to this. So when some persons, for their own political agenda, want to minimize the impact of the state of emergency, we knew what it did. We knew that without the state of emergency, you couldn't keep people at home. We knew that. We knew that without the state of the emergency, you can't lock down the country at 7 o'clock, at 5 o'clock, at no clock. You needed the instrument of the state of emergency to allow those kinds of measures, tough as they were, correct as they were, to be imposed here in St. Kitts and Nevis. So Minister Phipps is right, we remain unapologetic about the need to use the device of the state of emergency. Because we had a life first strategy, save life. Whatever the arguments others were making, we remain clear that the first priority of the government in and outside an emergency anyway. It must be the safety and security of its people and its residents. Fundamental. Anything else a government can avoid. But the government must never shirk from the fundamental responsibility to protect its citizens and residents within its jurisdiction. And in the context of the pandemic, we live that reality and we were able to do so through all the iterations of the SROs that came out of the emergency powers. And we want to thank the public at large for the broad compliance to these measures. Mr. Speaker, it is true to say that the world is still learning about COVID-19. It is fluid. It is dynamic. Sometimes you hear persons say, there's a new strain of the virus. And that that 
may behave in a particular manner distinct from what we are now accustomed to. We wait to see how these things will unfold, but we will continue on the path of delivering that safer and stronger future to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. The Honorable Member who last spoke said in his own style and in his own way, well, you know, we have come to give support, but what's been trouble in a St. Kitts? What pan trouble? Who caused the trouble? If there is trouble in the land, and there is trouble everywhere, it is not a function of this government. The virus came into our country, and we have been grappling with it. But look how much more successful we are to so many other countries. Every sector of our economy and society, I may add, has been opened up in a stepwise manner, in a careful and thoughtful manner. Agriculture and fisheries. Give the fishermen time. In due time, we gave them all the time they needed. Made exemption and exceptions for them. If they needed more time at sea, in the case of the fisher folks, apply to the commission of police, and it was granted. When we got over that, because we are in a learning curve, we move into the manufacturing sector from complete shutdown to where we are now. 90 plus percent of all the workers are back out to work over 1,200 plus workers are back to work. And those who are not yet there are those with underlying conditions and those who are waiting and the necessary physical rearrangements and retrofitting at their places of work, like Jara, for example, with multiple facilities. An excellent job by any measure. Well, retail and wholesale never close. Restaurants open up gradually. Take away dinners and lunches, and then you can go and you can dine in. Everything, construction was one of the earliest sectors that we open up. As you go into the curfew, you saw the roadworks continued because, again, there was a special demarcation for necessary infrastructural works to continue. We have now, on the 31st of December, October, sorry, opened up the rest of the country for tourism, a critical good sector to get a chance to revive itself. But we can't do it foolishly. We can't have a free-for-all. Again, we look at the best examples everywhere. And you therefore have to manage the open up. We identify a number of hotels, branded hotels, hotels that have had established protocols. And we say, they should, on the face of it, on the face of it, be able to provide a safe stake for visitors into the country, and importantly, to protect their employees too. We said we will learn. And as we learn from that experience, we will be nimble and agile in making the necessary adjustments. Good way to go. The experience elsewhere was that as soon as a country dropped its guard, you end up hearing the talk of community spread. And where did some of the community spread come from? 
It came from the hotels. Because persons working there are now part of the active front line. They are exposed to those visitors, providing them food and whatever the needs are, attempting to satisfy them. And so we say, in our model of this opening up, we are not going to let every hotel open its doors because it will be too much, too much of an exposure, and we therefore have to minimize it. It is exposure to our workers and their families. It is exposure to our health system. It is putting a high demands on our security forces who have hardly had a time to rest out of carnival into COVID-19 and state of emergency into a general elections demanded by the opposition, which they lost badly. This is how it is going. Major event after major event in the country. And we have to be careful to talk about caring when it suits them. But it seems for political purposes, they want to just shut back the door wide open. Let man come back a yard. You come back a yard in time. You come back a yard when it is convenient. You will come back a yard in a manner that protects those of us who stood in the yard. That is what will happen. We are a small country and every medical practitioner knows we have a limited number of rooms that could be put to isolation. As Senator Bernice here, Dr. Bernice here Nisbet would line. Well, are the doctors here too? They must understand, and therefore you can't sell the falsehood. Man, if you all want to come back home, come back a yard, man. Not going to work. In fact, it is an unwise thing to put that proposition. And everywhere, everywhere, or almost everywhere, where people are returning, they have to fill out the necessary forms. They now have to send them ahead online. That is what is done, online. So you have to send them before you come. What does that do? What does that do? It allows us to make the necessary preparation as best as we could in advance. So we know X number of persons are going to board the flights. These are the locations to which they will be going. And we therefore can do the necessary coordination with the taxi drivers, tourism, and all the other parties. You know that there are 40 persons, for example, to go to Jakarta or to go to Four Seasons. So you know for that particular day, you can go there. The Minister of Tourism said we had think active 29 taxi operators. So at least you know how these persons are going to be dispatched. But it is not just the dispatching, it is to be dispatched safely. That is what is new, safely. There is now a premium on safety. And that is why we need these advanced data that must come from our people. We would wish that everyone would come. In fact, they are encouraged, but they are encouraged to do so in accordance with the system that we have established for their own protection. And for our protection here, the new I heard the member for number six, who was before talking about modern language, the new phraseology, the new constructions. So don't say suffering no more. We understand suffering and suffering. 
people suffering, people infected, find the synonym of your choice. It's not an insensitivity. It is a word with which we are familiar. But he was saying, find a softer word, a nicer word, a more sensitive word. Bravo to the member for number six. But he wasn't saying that. When it comes to other things, let the man them come back at the yard. Everything we do in the country can't done as if we are the back of the land style. We have to have order. We have to have some sense of methodology or we will cast all the gains we would have made over the seven months astray. What is happening to St. Lucia? Once a model country, once a model country, now it has gone out of what? From about, well at one point it was under us. Now St. Lucia has 162 cases. 42.5, 42.5 for 100,000 of the population. Against a benchmark of say 20 or under 20. And what do we hear? Community spread. What do we hear? Is that in the effort for some people to come back into the yard? Whether from Guadeloupe or Martinique, nobody must tell you when to come. People came using diverse entry points into St. Lucia. People went on buses without being quarantined. And then we have the community spread. So what the members opposite are proposing, not in keep it with best practice, and certainly not in keeping with the health standards. Again, we can learn from each other. And the newest medical doctor certainly could teach the member for number six something about the health science of this, and certainly she can learn from him also. Well, one of the things she draw reference to which I will invite the member for number six to contemplate upon, is that the incubation period is 14 days minimum. And in fact, if you want to take it to the extreme, 14 to 21 day period. When the member for number six then posits the argument that when someone comes from a hotspot, in South Florida, New York, out of London, call anywhere, that that person be given differential treatment on the basis of nationality. I reject it as being unwise. Because you see, person coming home here from a hotspot has been exposed to the same environment substantially as a tourist who is coming. The person who is coming on a flight with someone who has the COVID, is a carrier of the virus for the time being, is exposed. So why should he come on the same flight, exposed as everyone on the airplane would be? And he can come to Tabernacle. He can go to St. Paul's. He can go to Sandy Point and start mingling, integrating. He can't have the double standards. One, they become difficult to police. But the member for number six knows, for example, that when we started the home quarantine, it failed because we were putting reliance on the honor of the individual. So we say, all right, come. You go and you quarantine at home. And then what did we hear? Those who should have been in quarantine were at the bar. Those who should have been in quarantine were at the strip. Those who should have been in quarantine because they had come back to the yard in St. Kitts, had gone up to Value Mart or had gone to Rams. That system then will not work. Our approach 
must be that we will do all in our power to keep people safe. And we have a life-saving strategy at the forefront of our actions in relation to COVID-19. So for the time being, there will be no exemption based on nationality. So if you're coming from St. Martin, you're coming from a hot spot. You're coming from Jamaica, you're coming from a hot spot. You're coming from America, you're coming from a hot spot. One rule, it makes it easy and it does not allow for trouble. Indeed, what we are doing really is the best practice. It is what the World Health Organization has said we must do. And yes, there are some countries that, has, that have diverted from the gold standard. Some have said we'll do five days quarantine. Well, it means that they are agreeing to accept a higher level of risk. We say that the gold standard is 14, and we will work with that for such time as we have other avenues of responding that would help mitigate and control the spread. And the member for number six rightly look at one of those tools. The four basic tools, really they are. And some of them we know. The diagnostic, the vaccine, the buffering of the health system, etc., and all the other protocols that we have been outlining. And again, here again, and that matter, we understand. And the member for number six must understand when he says, well, how long people will be under these conditions? The short answer, we don't know. We are optimistic. I have been in meeting representing the CARICOM heads of government as their leads person in relation to matter of health. And I hear from all the scientists, I hear from the representative of the EU, I hear from the representative of the World Health Organization that March 2021 is a good day. And the question with that is not so much we are hearing optimistic news every day. Member for number six mentioned at least two entities that have had good success rate in their trials. And yes, the vaccine is a good thing. And we should encourage our people to utilize it when it becomes available. One of the things we have attempted to do, one of the things, is to prevent, as it were, vaccine nationalism. And what do we mean by that? That only the powerful countries who have their labs, who have their resources, can monopolize the vaccine so that it will take a long time before it would become available to other countries, small countries, like St. Kitts and Nevis, with a relatively small um, population. We have come together a number of countries 186 of them are there about working as part of the COVAX facility, the COVID-19 Vaccine Global Access Facility, and Gavi, which is the Global Alliance for Vaccine and Immunizations. And we are attempting through that particular effort to ensure that we work together to achieve an affordable and accessible response to a vaccine. And to use a word that had come from Senator Phipps that will produce efficacious results. Simply mean it will work. It will be reliable. That is what the big word that Senator Phipps used meant. Efficacious in its outcomes. And yes, the member for number six heard right, that we, again, recognizing that this is a critical tool in the fight to defeat COVID-19, have already expended sums to ensure a down payment on the vaccine. 
that down payment is close to $800,000. And yes, we were able to secure a small portion of that down payment to Paho. The bulk of it, more than perhaps three quarts of it, would have come from the National Treasury. I don't know if the member for number six, I suspect he was speaking in dress about who get it and so on and so on. It's usual the political um, street talk back at the yard. But we have paid it. We have paid it. We were among the first of the countries in the Caribbean region to have put down our money there. Because, again, the lives, the lives of our people matter. And yes, livelihood is important. But if you have no life, you can't be focused on livelihood. Life comes first. And that has been our strategy. And I encourage the member for number six, of course, to invite his team to come on board and be part of the all of society approach. We have always invited them to be part. They have opted on many occasions not to be part of the solution in the country. Mr. Speaker, we have heard others who have come to remind us about, well, entertainment. We have heard that. You are doing something bad to the entertainers in the country. They can't tell us about that. Because even before COVID, we have been the government that has given more support to the entertainment industry. And we will continue to do so. It was probably maybe two Saturdays ago that the Minister of Entertainment met with a group of entertainers over at the Marriott Hotel to discuss the way forward. And with her, Commissioner of Police and his team, with her, our Chief, Chief of, um, what they call, Dr. Cameron Wilkinson, Medical Chief. Medical Chief of Staff, all there, so people understand. The truth is the new normal does not only apply to the churches. The new normal does not just only apply to our education sector, our schools. The new normal also applies to the entertainment industry. The new normal applies to us here in Parliament. We had to break down the barriers. We had to take away some of the space normally presented as the gallery, visitors' gallery, to ensure that we are in compliance. And certainly what we need to tell our entertainers, a lot more of what they do will have to be done virtually for such a time as this is prolonged. And what is the reason for that, really? Wherever there is a large group, the probability of a spread of the virus gets higher. It's a higher risk. So in events where people are close up, body touching, drinking, enjoying themselves, as the entertainment is really about that by and large, you can at times lose some of the discretion which you are to exercise. But the good news is that we are working a plan with our entertainers. And I have every confidence that our new Minister of Entertainment will be able to bring up a workable plan which the government will, will have devised in consultation with the entertainers. The Senator opposite reminds me of the former member for number two. And I don't know if it is by coincidence that they are sitting in the same place. She's not a rara, rara, rara as a member for number two. But the substance of the presentation is the same. Hmm? Former, sorry, member for number two. 
I haven't seen Marcel alive within a long while. I hope that she is well. But when you look at the substance of the presentation, when Marcella was here, it was always something off target. Some little thing that she went in a supermarket and somebody says, and it becomes a matter for the parliament. It doesn't matter what the conversation is. It doesn't matter. And so sometimes we would have to rise so often. Member for number eight would. Sometimes even the Attorney General, who like to let things pass. I say to you, can't let the lady say that. Prime <laughs> Minister. Marcel has gone off the topic. So we see a similar thing. And it pains me as someone who loves teachers, someone who loves teachers, to hear a teacher come into the parliament time after time to speak of the inadequacy in a deliberate way, not to lift up, not to empower, but almost to destabilize the system. It's unfortunate. Because when you ask the teacher, have you written your concerns to the principal of your schools? In bother with that. When you ask a teacher, have you written to your education officer to outline your concerns so that officialdom can respond? That teacher ain't in that. Teacher wants to come in the parliament and to grandstand. And when you say, this is the parliament, use those official channels because you're still being paid by the government. The teacher will say to you, well, you all can't tell me anything because I am a doctor, but she can't give injection. <laughs> That's the point of that arrogance that we hear from someone new to the parliament who should be encouraged to follow the highest examples of the Westminster parliamentary style, but they are encouraged in that behavior. If you listen to the senator, you would believe that the government has abandoned the poor. The financial secretary has said to me repeatedly, Prime Minister, St. Kitts and Nevis has the widest and most comprehensive social safety net of any country in the Caribbean. This is what it is. We have voucher programs. We have men's. We have so many names. We have PAP. We have alternative lifestyle program, and so on and so on. We have a wide and comprehensive range of support, and we are working to refine these. The PAP program expanded tremendously as a result of the COVID. Persons who hitherto were off the program were enrolled on the program because we recognize that now with the strange environment, they did not have the means to cope. That is why when we announced the $1,000 stimulus package, we had the decision to make Thousands of people involved in tourism and hospitality, they're not registered. They're not paying any social security contributions. We heard from a wide cross section of persons that, well, they lose the chance. According to some, why should they get a thousand dollars like me who took the time and paid as a self-employed person? Why should they get the same benefit when they had a choice and they opted not to. We are a compassionate government. We understand poverty. We understand crisis. We understand challenge. And we say we are all in it together. And we persuaded the Social Security to respond in a meaningful way. At one point, up to 8,000 plus persons received the $1,000 a month stimulus program. So yes, we are with our people and we will continue to be there. We are a government 
And we understand empathy. That is how we responded that way. We have a conscience, we have a soul, we have a spirit, we have compassion. And we did all that we have done for our people. I would say to her that what we want is not the continuation, if you will, of government handouts or charity. Welcome as that is. And I want to commend several individuals and several entities that have been giving generously to those in need. Only last Sunday, Ami Bakery um, provided lunches to some 5,000 persons. I want to commend him for that generosity and to thank him and to say continue it for as long as you could. Because if there's anything that we can do for the least among us, we must feel duty bound so to do. And I won't quote this scripture because the member for number eight will quote it when he comes to speak again at some point in the future. That is what it has been about. I want to commend supermarkets like Value Mart and Rams who early when the COVID-19 had come indicated they reach out and they said, we want to give some support. And so I say publicly, thank you to them for the contribution that they would, make, they would have made. I want to say thank you to some friends I've met on the peninsula and elsewhere who indicated that they had used a number of nationals to bring support to a number of persons. The state cannot do it alone. And that is why from the very onset, we said it is an all of society approach. Our people must not feel so hopeless that you can't contribute even a cup of tea to your neighbor, even to assist with a meal one day of the week. There's something each of us can do for someone who is suffering. And at times when members opposite seem to take a kind of pride, there is something, uh, what would be the word? Sadist. There is something uncomforting about the way they speak about the hard times that people have. They speak about it in glee, mm -hmm. as if it's sweet them. You see, the elections are over. And the people had an opportunity the member for number six went there when he said that we had an election during the COVID-19 season. We had a very good election. The results were good. And the people had an opportunity to give a vote of confidence to the policies of the Team Unity Administration. And they did so. And that is why I don't see Marcel alive over there. That is why I don't see who would have been the backbencher. Well, Nigel Carty was an elected member. I don't see Patrice Nisbet over there. And that is why I don't see Canvas Maynard over there. And we had warned them. The member for number six is a smart man. And he recognized that some of those young Turks had to go. <laughs> and so as they said their things off base, irrelevant, irrelevant to the parliamentary debate, he edged them on. You could, you could, you could. Today, <laughs> <he's not> <laughs> <laughs> <He's not> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Remember, for number six makes me laugh, you know, you enjoy the smartness. Today he stands alone as king of the land. <laughs> so, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> Speaker, in closing though, I want to say that we are not yet out of the woods and we will continue to work hard. We wouldn't be so arrogant on the government side to think that we have it all wrapped up. Mm -hmm. So we listen to advice. 
We will pick sense out of nonsense, wherever it comes from, opposition, other groups, other individuals. But we welcome construct ideas to help us deliver the stronger and safer future. Not just for supporters of the government, but for all of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. Again, it has been a very difficult experience. It has been tiring for me as the leader of the country. I recall some weeks I had to be on the AG. AG, when will I get the speech to be able to announce what the new protocols are? Sometimes the AG get it to me late, but I have to understand it and make sense of it too. And we had a delay. It was a very taxing period. So I want, in closing again, to say a special thank you to the Attorney General and his team, and his particular those involved with the legal drafted, who had at times, as the virus spread around the world, have had to respond. Their skills, their prowess, and their patriotism and love for St. Kitts and Nevis shone brightly at those times. And so I say thanks to you, the Honorable Attorney General, and to your team. And indeed, it is in deference to the contribution of the Office of the Attorney General that I gave you the single honor of really leading this important and historic bill that should take us further on the path and the journey of the stronger and safer future. May it please the Honorable House, I thank you.